So, hi everyone. So, uh, I will present you some results we've got over the, when looking at the climate change over the Sahel. So, here we have a time series of the observed, okay, of the observed precipitation over the Sahel. And uh, as you can see, there is a kind of a decadal variability. And what has mo been a, a very strong motivation for the scientific community was that there was a very strong decrease in precipitation from the 60s to the 80s, which has led to a strong drought. So if we look at the uh, difference of precipitation between this period and a uh, uh, more recent period, you can see that there was a, a strong anomaly, a negative anomaly in precipitation over the whole sail, which has led to a strong to starvation and migration over the sail. Uh, hopefully, since the 80s, the precipitation had recovered, or partially recovered, because we, we still don't have the same levels that, that we, we had in, in, the, in the 50s. Um, so, if we look at precipitation over the sail, we know that the monsoon is due to the northward shift, the migration of the ITCZ over the continent. So, when we go from March to, to August, there is more and more precipitation over the sail. And then, uh, we have the withdrawal period with less and less precipitation from August to October. But this recovery has been associated with more precipitation, with a stronger trend, positive trend in precipitation in September and October here, than in, uh, in May and June. So, it's stronger at the end that during the early period. And also, if we split the Sahel into two boxes, looking at what is happening over uh, west of 10, 10 degrees west of the Sahel, we can see that there is no recovery at all over Senegal. But if we look eastward, between 0 and 10 degrees east, uh, there is a recovery. So this recovery is actually, there is a trend, but it's quite complex in terms of, of uh, spatial patterns and, uh, and timing. So now the question is what will happen in the future? So if we think that uh, cell precipitation are associated with the SST like the AMV, we can expect a decrease in precipitation because we are going to a negative phase of the AMV. But we can also think that this recovery can continue in the future, especially because there are some people arguing that the recovery is partially due to the increase in greenhouse gases. So we can get more precipitation. Uh, of course, to figure out what could happen in the future, we have to use climate models. So if you look at the semi-5 models, actually the, the fifth report of the IPCC did concluded that um, there is actually no, con no clear consensus and there is no conclusion for cell precipitation in the future. And this is due to the fact that there is too much uncertainty in simulating and predicting precipitation over the sail. Um, so, there are several sources of uncertainties. This is a plot which is from the, the paper of Hawkins and Sutton in 2011, in which we can see the, the revolution of um, like global precipitation. So, we have the observed precipitation, uh, sorry, the observed precipitation and the, the precipitation of the climate models. Uh, so, they did compute the uncertainty which is due to the internal climate variability. So, it's a fact that models are some trouble to operate on the different phase of variability over CCT and the teleconnection with precipitation over land. Uh, they did define that this internal climate variability, uncertainty is due to the internal climate variability. It's not very strong, not very big, but and, and not evolving with time. I mean, it's still it's very constant with time. There is another source of uncertainty, which is the model uncertainty, which is due to the fact, uh, to the use of one particular model. So, of course, on from one model to another, we have different parameterization, so it's a different way to simulate and represent the climate system, so we have different results which is for each of them. And other uncertainties, which is due to the use of a particular scenario, because we don't know how the society and economy will evolve in the future. And if we look at this plot, we can see the uncertainty which are due to the internal climate variability um, is around one third of the total uncertainty for a very short term projections, but if we look at the end of the 21st century, finally, it's a model uncertainty which is dominating uh, this plot. So I will take a look of each of this kind of uncertainty. So first, I, um, <coughs> so to look at the uh, difference we, which is due to the use of one or another scenario, here I did show you, I show you a plot of, uh, that's a change of precipitation over, the, over West Africa. So it's a difference between uh, a future period, which is here um, on the left, mid-term period, so it's 
2050 minus an historical period with 75 models and the RCP 4.5 emission scenario. So it's a low medium emission scenario. And we can see that there is an increase in precipitation in the future of the central cell and a decrease of the western cell, which is consistent with this recovery I've shown you that we got in observation. But if we look at the RCP 8.4 emission scenario, so the higher emission scenario, we can see exactly the same pattern. So the colors are different because, of course, it's a different color bar. But we have exactly the same thing with an increase in precipitation of our central cell and a decrease of our western cell. Western cell. So the use of one particular scenario doesn't change at all the, the result in terms of pattern. Of course, if you use a higher emission scenario, you will have stronger changes. The magnitude will be stronger. OK, so now, um, if you want to, to quantify the impact of the internal variability over the force response, over the impact of climate change, uh, it's a bit tricky to use only one number. And uh, in most of the CIM5 models, we, have, we just have a very few number of simulations. So here, I've used a large ensemble of the NCAR, which consists of 40 members with both historical and RCP 8.5 emission scenario. So I've been using an ocean atmosphere copper climate model to simulate the climate. Um, so if you look at this model, that's the difference of the, the average of the 40 members between the future period, which is 2010-2049, minus the current period. So we can see that we have this contrast in precipitation, which is very consistent with uh, the, the multimodal ensemble <coughs> mean of the same five. Uh, and if we define two boxes over the western and the central cell, we can also see that over the western cell, the anomaly, the negative anomaly is strong in GGA from June to August, while over the central cell, it's mostly strong in August, September, October. So it's not occurring at the same time in the year. Uh, and this is also quite consistent with uh, the ensemble mean of, if you use 35 or 30 same five models, we will get the same behavior. So here we says 40 members that we have with this model. Uh, we, we, we define the first response here, which is the average of the 40 members. And the delta is the anomaly, so it's the difference between the future minus the historical period. Uh, and if you uh, take each of the 40 members and you remove the first response to each of those members, you got what we call the internal variable here, component. So that's a change in, in precipitation, which is due to the internal climate variability. And so if you look at all the, the, the 40 members for uh, short-term projections, we can see that, so of course, it's just very tiny plots, but you can see that sometimes you have uh, an increase in precipitation, sometimes you have a decrease in precipitation, so there is a large spread of uh, the response we can get only due to the internal climate variability. That's why using only one number could be a bit tricky. Um, so if we focus over the western sail, and here, um, so western sail and in uh, GGA, so in the beginning of the monsoon season. Um, so here I did select two uh, particular members. So on the left, on the right, you have the, the first response, which is just the average among the 40 members. So of course, we have the same one for each members. But if we look at these two members, so we have one which is simulating a, a strong decrease in precipitation over the western sail while the other one is not uh, predicting anything, well, there is no change over the western sail. And this difference for short-term projections, it's only due to the fact that in one case, we have the natural mode of variability, which is leading to less precipitation over the sail, while in another member, um, we have an increase in precipitation due to the internal climate variability. So this internal climate variability is very strong. It's able to obscure the first response over some periods or to uh, exacerbate the, the impact of climate change. So now if we look at the central cell and uh, from August to October we have the same behavior with uh, the first response which is this time leading to more precipitation. In one member we have a strong increase in precipitation because the internal variab climate variability is exacerbating the change in precipitation. In another time we have at the opposite a decrease in the precipitation. Um, so now I, I was trying to do it in a more systematic way. So on the left, we have the change in, in precipitation over the western cell and in, in GGA. So we can see that there is a, a decrease, which is continuous with time. Uh, the gray shading is the spread 
among the 40 members, that's the change in precipitation for the 40 members, I mean the internal component variability for the 40 members. And uh, I did define a type, time of emergence, which is when the first response gets stronger than the internal climate variability, so when the red line comes out of the, of the gray shading. And over the western cell, we have to wait uh, the two uh, 1080s to get a, a signal that we can define as robust. Over the central cell, we just have to wait for 2050s, the 2050s, so it's happening a little bit more quickly. Um, okay, I also wanted to know how many members we need to be able to get a robust signal over the cell. So to do so, I used a signal-to-noise framework, which is, so the signal-to-noise ratio is a, a ratio between the first response, which is the average between the 40 members. Okay. Uh, by the, 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 the standard deviation of the 40 uh, projections of the 40 members. And I was targeting a signal-to-noise ratio which could be greater than one or greater than two. And to define how how many members I need, I, I did resemble the data to get a, a lot of, uh, of ensemble of two members or three members or four members. So I just randomly pick up two members among the 40 members and I did, I did it a, a lot of times to get a large ensemble of two member ensembles. Okay. Uh, so I did it for a number of members from two to uh, 40, actually 39. So basically what this means is that, uh, so here we have the time, the number of numbers we need, and when we have a gray bar here, it means that we have a signal to noise ratio which is greater than one. So it means that over the western Sahel, in the 2030s, we need uh, something like 35 numbers to get a first response which, is, we, which will be greater than the internal climate variability. So uh, a signal robust of climate change over the western cell. But we can see that it's just occurring from time to time. It's not very robust and not very consistent. We have, it's a bit big better at the end of the century, but it's still, we, we would still need something like 40 members. Over the central cell, we need still 30, 40 members to get a, a consistent result over the central cell. But if you look at the end of the 21st century, we could need 20 members to get a signal robust. So if we use only one member, which is given by the semi-5, sometimes it's just one, two or three members, we could struggle to get something very consistent, which was, is really happening in the model. Um, well, of course, this is just a year-to-year -year evolution, so if, if I, I do a 10-year running mean over this test time series, I would just need two or three members to get something consistent over both the so central and the western side. So uh, we can see that the internal climate variability has a strong impact, particularly on short-term projections. It's less true for, uh, for long-term projections at the end of the 21st century, which could be a problem uh, in, uh, in predicting changes for short-term projections because there's just a few members, number of members in the semi-5 exercises. Um, but this strong impact of the internal climate variability, of course, we can use it. It's not only a problem. We can use it to predict climate. So, for instance, here we have uh, in this plot the observed precipitation over the Sahel. In, in black, you have the GPCC, so the observation, so we can see the, 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 the drought and kind of recovery after that. And uh, in this paper of uh, Katishin, they have been using the pre 3 which is a prediction system. And here we have the time series of the prediction system in red for every year. Oh, it is in the in November, but you have it for every year. And you can see that the model is able to reproduce the observed precipitation. And if we look at another lead time, two to five years, so when we do the average between the second to the fifth years of each incast, we can see that the model is able to reproduce pretty well the, the decadal evolution of precipitation over the sale. And if we do the correlation of this two time series for each grid point, you can see that we have a reddish sale which means that uh, the model is pretty able to, to predict precipitation over West Africa. And they, they did argue that this is due to the fact that the IMV is impacting strongly precipitation over the sail and that we can predict evolution of the temperature of, over, over the North Atlantic Ocean as the model is able to reproduce the tail connection to the North Atlantic and the sail, so we can predict something over West Africa. 
Uh, the same behavior has been, been obtained with semi five models in the papers of uh, Gaetani and, uh, and Moino. Okay, so now I'll speak about uh, the, the model uncertainty. So uh, to do so, I've been using semi this large number of semi five models. So first, I, I've done the differences. So I only use one number for each model. Um, first, I did the difference between the uh, future period which is 2060-2069 minus the historical period. I got a, a map of uh, climate change for each model, then I did some pattern correlation between each of these maps and each of the models. So basically in this tree, when we have two models which are closed, this means that they are simulating the same, uh, very similar changes in precipitation of, of, over West Africa. So then I did define four groups of models. I removed the GFTL models because they are I did consider them as, uh, as uh, outliers. So there is four groups of models, of course. If some of them, there is more models, for instance, it's a group number three is a number four. So I'm, I'm not giving the same weight to each of those groups, but I'm looking at the different trajectories we can get over the sail. And now if you do the average over each of these groups, so if you do the average, for instance, over all the models of the group number one or all the models of the group number two, you can get things like this. So Models of the, of, the, of the group number one they are producing more precipitation over the cell, and we have something which is very homogeneous in the future. So we, we have the climatology in red and the anomalies with the shading, so with, with the colors, so we can see that there is a kind of northward shift of the ITCZ over the cell. For the second and third group of models, we have something which is different. Um, and we have a kind of contrast between the western and the central cell. Uh, in the second group of models, the precipitation is still ve very, very south, so it's close to the coast. While in the third group, the precipitation are located over the, the sail, over the central sail. And finally, the fourth group of models is producing less precipitation in the future. So of course, it's a problem because if you want to pick just one or two or three models, you can get a red random results which won't be consistent at all with what the same five. Uh, exercise is, is giving. Um, of course, there's changes in precipitation are also associated with uh, a strong spread in temperature. So in the first group of models, there is a very large warming oops, sorry, <laughs> over the, the Sahara. And there is also more, there is also strong warming over the North Atlantic Ocean. In the third group of models, there is also a north -south shift of the central cell, and there is a large warming. In the fourth group, we can see that the, the magnitude of the impact is very different of the cell. So there is different mechanism behind that. <coughs> so um, if we split the cell into two boxes, western and central cell, and if we look at uh, this is an molar, so we have uh, the, the time here, different months of the year, we have the latitude with the y axis. Uh, the climatology is in red, so we can see the, the northward shift of the monsoon and the southward shift at the end of the, of the rainy season. And if you look at the anomaly, we can see that there is more precipitation in the group one in August, September, October, and also during the, the withdrawn period of the monsoon, so at the end of the monsoon season. It's also true for the second group of models and for the third group of models. So we can see that even if there is uh, a large spread, a lot of uncertainties, we have some results which are consistent among the models. So we can still get a consensus, which is that we have more precipitation of our central cell, less precipitation of the western cell. But of course, so here we have the change in precipitation. If we took an average of 32 members, of 32 models, semi five models, we have this contrast. There is some dots when at least 80% of the model are able to reproduce the, the thing of the anomaly of the multimodel mean. So here it's only consistent over central cell, but not very over the western cell. And the thing is that if you look at the spread of the change in precipitation among the 40 members, 40 models, sorry, you can see that the spread among the model is clearly stronger. We have around 1.8 or 2 millimeter by day, which is stronger than the change in precipitation. So we have a very small changes in precipitation with a very large spread. That's why it's, it's so much uncertain. And on the right, we have the same thing, but with uh, the NCAR large ensemble, it, it shows one model and 40 members. We have more or less the same uh, change in precipitation, but it's more consistent and robust because there is, large, there is a very weak spread between each members 
in this model. So we can see that uh, the uncertainties which are due to the use of one model or another is very stronger than the uncertainty which is due to how we, we, we simulate the internal climate variability. So there is a, a consensus which emerged with more precipitation versus central soil. Um, so this is a, a paper of, uh, of Caroline Dunning in which she has been looking at the different data of onset cessation data over the sail. So here in blue, uh, on, on this map, this means that the onset of the monsoon will occur a little bit later over the western sail. And this is consistent with the fact that there is less precipitation at the beginning of the, uh, of the rainy season. Uh, the end of the rainy season, I mean, the cessation date we, we, will occur also later of our central sail. And finally, the, the rainy season will be shorten, shorter over the western sail. So we have a shortening of the, of the rainy season over the western sail in Senegal, uh, which looks to be consistent also among models. So we have the change in the, in the dynamic and the seasonal cycle, which looks to be consistent among every model, most of the models. So there is a modification of the seasonal cycle. This is some indices uh, in which we have, for instance, uh, R5 D, which is a uh, seasonal maximum five day precipitation. So it has been used to, to, to look at the risk of flooding over West Africa. The so consecutive tri days also. So for, for, for the CIS index R5D, there is a, an increase of the central sail. There is more consecutive tri days about the western sail. And this looks also to be consistent. So we, we have large impacts over the sail. Um, yeah, so the, the ID now was, um, so if you pick one model randomly, so if you want to, to, to make a case study anomalies, for instance, if you want to take the data of one model to feed a regional model or uh, agricultural model or hydrological model or uh, another model. So you, you need to download a large amount of data so you cannot do it with, semi, with all the, the semi five models, especially if you have some three hourly data or something like this. So I was trying to, to define a method in which I will be able to, uh, to propose five models that we could use and that could be representative of the semi five ensemble. And uh, the idea was that maybe we can use those five mobile models instead of using the 30 models or 40 models of the semi five exercise. So first I was thinking that maybe we can, we can uh, define the model using this metric of the best models. So I've been using the group of models I've shown you before with the tree, the hierarchical clustering. Uh, so if you do the difference between the, the climatology for each model minus the observation. So here we have the bias for each group of models. And we can see that bias are around the same for each group of models. So see, this one was projecting more precipitation, but it's not due to the fact that there, there would be a wet bias because it's not the case. And finally, the conclusion, so I, I, I did so with precipitation temperature as a variable. And the conclusion, conclusion I got was that it's not very clear that we can define the best model to uh, a select model for a case study analysis. There is no so clear relationship between the mean bias and the, the, the projection they have, at least in this case. So uh, the idea was more to uh, randomly select some models. So I did pick four models in the, the, the set of the 32 models I had. Um, so this one, for instance. So with the color, we have the, the multimodal mean. And I was trying to see if I can reproduce this multimodal mean only selecting four models. So uh, I, I did a selection of four models. I did random select the models, and then I, I did it a, a very large number of times. And then we have a hatching when at least 45% of the new ensemble are able to represent an anomaly which is comparable in terms of seeing than this multimodal anom uh, anomaly. So if you do so, only selecting randomly the models, you have a chance to reproduce this uh, increase in, in precipitation over some central sail, but that's all, there is nothing over the western or even over the tropical Atlantic Ocean. So it might not be a very good idea to just randomly select the models. Um, well, there is this one, which is a bit cheating because uh, I only took the, the models that are able to reproduce this pattern. So that's uh, the models of the third group, the, the third group 
of models and I did pick four models in this, in this one. Um, I did it because of course if you want to download some data sometimes you, you will say okay I will take this four models but sometimes you just don't have the data on the website or there's no the variables you want is not there or it's not complete so you, you will have to pick up another one. So I did it randomly and uh, if you do so, if you just pick four models among the, the, the group number three, you will reproduce very robustly the, the change in precipitation over central, the western Sahel and over the, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in this one, I took only, so there is four models, I took one model, one for each group of models. And I did it randomly and if you do so, you have a good chance to reproduce what is happening over central Sahel. You don't have the decrease in precipitation over the western Sahel, but this decrease is sometimes not very robust uh, according to the number of models we will have. So it could be a good, uh, a good way to select models. Okay, so we are going to my take home message, uh, which is that what I've shown is that the, the, the most important source of uncertainty is more due to the fact to using one model or another model, so that's a thing we have to, to improve in the future how we simulate climate, of course. Uh, but there is some consensus. Even if there is a large spread, there is a consensus in the fact that there is more precipitation over the central Sahel, uh, a bit less over the western Sahel, and that we have a modification of the seasonal cycle. There is another thing which is uh, uh, quite robust. So here I, I teach represent what I've called the African rainfall pattern index which is just the difference between the change in precipitation of the central Sahel minus the change in precipitation of the western Sahel. So I did standardize everything. And if you look at the, the, the red index here, you can see that this contrast in precipitation is from the 1920 to, to the end of the 21st century. It's, it's increasing with time. Uh, that's in the NCAR large ensemble, so it's just one model, but you can do it with other models. It's pretty consistent. So that's something which is very consistent among models and uh, in which we don't really have an explanation yet. I did it also using um, the precipitation of the, using different periods. So the precipitation of the central cell in August, September, October, minus the precipitation of the western cell in GGA. And we have something which is a bit uh, better, I mean, so a stronger signal. Here we have the internal climate variability, so we have an emergence a bit quickly. Um, yep, yeah. that's all. <laughs>